the most important thing on this slide is my email address. It's Erin at SQLSkills.com. If you have any questions after this session that you don't have a chance to ask, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer them. If you're not familiar with the SQL Skills team, the members are Paul Randall and Kimberly Tripp. They're the owners. And then uh, myself, Glenn Berry, Jonathan Cahayas, and Tim Radney. And we provide training throughout the US and abroad. We actually have training going on this week in Seattle. And I'm flying out there Thursday for uh, E2 next week. We also provide consulting, remote DBA services, present at conferences. And if you're interested in hearing from us on a regular basis, you can become an insider, and Paul will send you an email about every other week that's got some of his thoughts, usually a, a cool video about something. Um, John just did one about the new uh, improvements in Plan Explorer, which were released this week. So good stuff. If you're interested in attending our training, we have a training page. Uh, as I said, we've got a couple of events going on this week and next, and then again in November. And if you've never used Pluralsight, then this is your chance. If you email Paul directly, I love this, I get to give out his email address. It's paul at sqlskills.com. And if you email him and say that you attended this user group meeting, then he will send you a free code for 30 days of Pluralsight. And if you haven't ever used it, it's a very, very good tool for online training. We've got over 120 hours of content specific to SQL Server from the SQL Skills team. And there are three courses out there specific to extended events what I'm going through today, and then two courses from John. So depending on how you learn, one of them may sit with you better than another. Here's our plan for today. We're going to talk about going from profiler to extended events. We'll talk about targets, and we'll talk about things to pay attention to with regard to performance. And I like to start with just a little bit of background before I go into a demo, which is talking about what extended events is. Because I think when a lot of people think about profiler, they think of it as a tool that they use to, to capture queries and to see what's going on within SQL Server. And if I asked how many of you use Profiler, have used it, Profiler or Trace, can someone tell me what percentage of the room raises their hand and says, yes, they have used Profiler or Trace? How many of you? Everybody. Everybody. Perfect. You are my target audience. How many of you have used extended events? Half? Okay, cool. All right, so extended events is, people tend to think of it as the replacement for profiler and trace, but it's really more than that. It's really a new way to look at troubleshooting. And it was introduced in SQL Server 2008. It's part of SQL OS, and I think that it didn't have great adoption in the beginning because there was no UI. Everything was done through T-SQL until SQL Server 2012. And so extended events is a new way to look at troubleshooting. And it's this event handling system within SQL Server that interacts with the SQL Server code to allow you to collect data, information about what's happening inside SQL Server. And you can create these really powerful, complex event sessions that you had no ability to create in Trace. And so again, it lives within SQL OS, and it's a bunch of services that interact uh, with each other and interact with SQL Server processes and DLLs, like the SQL Server EXE, um, like the, um, the SQL OS DLL. Uh, and so there's different objects that become part of our vocabulary when we use extended events. And so you might have heard people talk about events, which you're familiar with from Trace, even if you didn't use the, the vocabulary. And we also talk about targets and predicates and actions and maps and types. And you may also hear some people talk about packages. And a package is just a logical container that groups together a set of events, predicates, actions, targets, types, and maps. And knowing that isn't hugely critical. Just understand that this is new vocabulary when we talk about extended events. And as we go through this session today, we're going to we're going to dig into those first four in more detail so that you'll understand what they are and how to basically map them to what you know from Trace and uh, Profiler. And so that's where we're actually going to start is with what we know and love best, which is Profiler. So let's open this up. Right, and this is home, this is what we know. And typically, if you came in here, 
to start a new trace, you'd probably come in and select File, New Trace, and you'd connect to your instance. And I would guess that a lot of you use a template, because templates make your life a lot easier in that I've already got the events selected. I don't have to go select them manually. So I've got a template here that I'm going to use called High Reads. Not uncommon to look for queries that maybe have a high duration, a high CPU, a high number of reads. So that's what we're doing here with this one. And if you look at the events, you can see that I have RPC completed and SQL statement completed, both selected here. And I've got a bunch of columns selected as well. And if I look at my filters, right, you can see here that I've got greater than or equal to 10,000 reads. So in this case, I'm only looking for two events, RPC completed and SQL statement completed. And I only want to see those events if the reads are greater than 10,000. Now, I can go ahead and just click Run here. And I would do that. And then typically, I'm going to bet that most of you will come up and stop this immediately. Because running the trace actually in Profiler is extremely expensive and not something that I recommend doing in a production environment. I'm not saying that I've ever brought down a production environment or that I know anyone who has. But it's quite possible, if you don't have your filter set appropriately, if you've got a high volume workload, that running this in the UI can severely degrade your performance. So the best thing to do is to stop that and then select File, Export, Save Out That Script Trace Definition here. And then, rather than run everything through here, come back over here into Management Studio and open that up. So where did I save that? I probably saved it out to CTemp. There we go. So this is the script that gets created. And I've, I've got a copy of this, which I already had open here, which I've just commented a little bit. So I'm going to close this one, and we're going to flip to our commented version, which is almost exactly the same. It's just a little bit older, but it's for the same events. And if you've never looked at this, I want to take a minute here and walk through it, because this is how we're going to make that leap from what we know about Trace over to what we want to know about extended events. So the first part of this script has create a queue. So we declare some variables. We specify what the max file size is going to be, because we're going to write this out to a file. And then the next section, we have our SP trace create, where we take that trace ID, and we, we're going to get that as an output. And we pass in the path for where we want the files to go. And then beneath that, we set the events. And if you look at the original file, this is, this is code over here that I've added. But what we have is a bunch of SP trace set events. And then we have the trace ID, and then we have numbers. And unless you've spent a lot of time writing these manually, or looking at these, or if you really like to read books online, you may not know that SP trace set event 10.1 means I'm enabling the RPC completed event, and I want to capture text data. And 10.9 is RBC completed client process ID, right? These are all listed yeah. over here. So this tells me what event column combinations I'm capturing. And then down here, this next section is for the SQL statement completed event. So depending on what events and columns I have, I might just have a few SP trace set events here, or I might have a whole bunch of them. But this is basically saying what we're going to capture. Then beneath that, I set the filters. And here we can see. I've got the read filters down here. It's this big int filter, 10,000. So it uses SP trace set filter to specify. And you can't read this, right? You need books online to tell you. But basically, we're saying we're setting the filter of reads greater than equal to 10,000. And then the last thing we've got is SP trace set status. And we start the trace. And then it displays that trace ID for us. So if I run this right now. Uh, it throws an error and tells me that it can't create a file, because what probably happened is I've got a leftover file out here in C temp, which I do. All right, this is one of the things that I don't love about trace, is that if I start a trace and stop it, and then I want to start it again, I either have to move the file, delete it, or create it with a different name. So I deleted that file. Now this one starts, and I have a trace ID of two. That's great. Now, how do I go from this to extended events? And the easiest thing to do is to download this stored procedure right here from Jonathan's blog. It's called SP SQL Skills Convert Trace to Extended Events. And it does all of the work for you. 
So I'm not gonna go through the store procedure line by line. I've already created it here in my environment. But what it does is it maps all the events from trace to the comparable event in extended events. And it figures out what columns you're capturing and what filters you're using and creates the event session that is basically the same thing. So if we look at the code to run this, it's very simple, right? It's just an execute of that store procedure. And then I've got some input parameters. The first is the trace ID. If you remember when I started my trace over here, it output the trace ID of two. So that's the trace ID that I need to put here. I have to have the trace created. It doesn't have to be running, but the event definition has to be there, and it can be started or not, right? But it needs to be able to look at the, the system views to figure out what the definition is for that trace in order to create the event session. Then I'm going to specify an event session name, what I want to call it. So we're just going to call it reads filter trace. I want it to print the output, so I set that equal to one, but I don't want it to execute the code. So we're going to run this. And then it's going to create the T-SQL that I would need to create that extended event section. So I can take this, and I can copy it, and I can open up a new window and paste it in. And within seconds, I have the code to create the event session, which is just like the trace that I already started. Now, I have the same code commented like I did before for the trace. So let me open that up. Because what I want to do is I want to look at these side by side. So on the left, I have the trace code. And on the right, I have the code from Jonathan's store procedure, which is the event session. So now let's look at these two side by side. If you remember in the beginning for the trace, we had these variables that we declared. We created a queue. The first thing we've got here is an if exists where it looks to see if the event session exists, and if it does, it drops it. So this is just some extra code that John's added. I'm not going to worry about that. What I have really to start the event session is create event session and then the name of it. Right? This is something I passed in as part of my input parameter for that store procedure. I can name it anything I want. Create event session on server, because these event sessions are instance specific. Now. I'll tell you right now that I can export them and I can, I can throw them on different servers, right? But these are specific to an instance. All right, so create a queue over here, create an event session on the right. The next thing I have for my trace is SP trace create, and then remember I had my path. I just want you to hold on to that for the moment. We're not quite there yet. Then we have our events and our columns, right? We have the SP trace set event, which does our event column combinations. On the extended event side, really straightforward. Add event SQL server .rpc completed. The first thing you should notice here is that this is in plain text. So I can easily understand what events I'm looking for. And by the way, I'm not expecting that you're going to go and write this code in the same manner. But this is how we make that transition. And I want you to understand how easy it is to look at this code and understand what we're doing. So I've added the event RPC completed. And then underneath that, I have this action. <laughs> Now, some of you may be looking at the list of actions here on the right, and then looking at the list of columns on the left and thinking, hmm, something doesn't match up here. And it's true. And here's a fundamental difference between trace and extended events. With trace, right, when we went into our events here and we selected these columns, you, you know that you've got all these other columns here, right, that you could have selected. And the way that trace works is that it's actually selecting all of those for every event. And then once it filters and determines it's keeping the event, it goes and says, oh, you only want these columns. I'm going to throw out the rest of them. So for RPC completed, it collects client process ID, database name, error event sequence, group ID, host name, integer data. It collects all of these. And then only at the end, when it sees that you don't care about them, does it discard them. So that's a lot of overhead. With extended events, every event has what's called a default payload, which is a set of elements that it's collecting. These are the most relevant, most useful elements. So you'll notice over here that we don't have duration. We don't have reads. We don't have writes. We don't have CPU. And that's because those, that information is collected for RPC completed by default. 
So it's part of this def default payload. These other entries here, these actions, this is something else that I want to collect that's not part of the default payload. So I, I capture it as an action. I tell SQL Server, OK, when this event fires, if I'm going to capture it, then I want you to also get for me the client app name, the client PID, the database ID, the server instance name, et cetera. So it's more efficient than trace in the sense that it only pulls initially what it really needs. But then there is this overhead that you can add by collecting more fields. So one of the things to start thinking about is, is this information that I really need and really use Okay, when you're looking at actions? Beneath my actions, I have where. I have my where clause, my predicate, you'll hear it called. Right? This is my filter. So here we're saying where logical reads greater than equal to 10,000. Now, if I scroll down, you'll see that I've got add event SQL server statement completed. These are separate entries, which means that I can have different actions. I just happen to have the same ones here. And it also means, this is where it gets really cool, I can have different predicates. Now, I made them the same here, but I could go in and I could say, and database ID equals five. Right? My predicates don't have to be the same for my events. They did when we were looking at trace. So this is really cool. Now, beneath this part, I have my add target. So if we come back up on our trace side, Right? This is where, in this SP trace create, we had specified where we wanted our output file to go and what our max file size was. That is defined here down in our target. Our target, one of our vocabulary words, is where do I want the data to go? And so to make this analogous to trace, we're going to have it go to an event file, just like we did for trace. So that's what our target is called, event file. We specify a file name, and notice it's a .xel file. I specify a max file size, just like I did before, and I specify a max number of rollover files. Fantastic. So now what I want to do is I want to have these both running side by side, and I want them to be exactly the same. So I'm going to stop the trace that I had really quick, and I'm going to delete that file that it created. And then we're going to run this again, but this time I want to take out this filter because I don't want to worry about creating queries that have more than 10,000 reads. So I'll comment this, comment this out. So I wouldn't recommend this event session here because I'm running it with no filter, but this is a VM, so it's not such a big deal. So now I'll go ahead and run this script again, and the trace gets created, and it gets started, and it has a trace ID of two. When I run this on the extended event side, it creates the event session, but it doesn't start it. So this is a difference here between trace and extended events. So if we look at this next set of code, we can look to see what we have for extended event sessions in the server event sessions view. And for trace, we can use fn trace get info. So if I look at both of these, you'll see that for extended events, I have system health, I have always on health, and I have XE reads filter trace. This is the one that we created. System Health has been there since SQL Server 2008. Um, any version higher than that, it's always there and it's running in the background. It's kind of like the default trace, but not. It's not the same set of events. It's different events. And then we've got Always on Health. So if you're using an availability group, you'll see this enabled. It's always there. It's just only running if you're running an AG. On the trace side, we've got trace ID of one, which is the default trace, which is typically always running, unless for some interesting reason you've decided not to, to run it and you've stopped it. And then we have the trace that we created with a trace ID of two. Okay, so I can see what's been created. This isn't necessarily what's running, but this is what's been created. So if I want to start my event session after I've created it, my code is right here. Alter event session, the name of the event session on the server, set the state to start. For trace, we use the SP trace set status and set it to one, which has already happened, so that's already running. So now if I want to see what's running, I'm going to join server event sessions over to DMXE sessions for my extended events. And for trace, I'm going to hit sys.traces. And so now I can see that system health is running, and it's been running for over a week now. Always on health is not. I don't have an availability group. And the reads filtered trace just started up.
And then my default trace has been running for quite a while. And then I've got the trace I just created running as well. So now I can see that they're both running. And if I want to capture some data, which I will do, let's let some queries run. So while this is running and while I'm capturing some data, any questions so far? OK, so either it's making perfect sense or you guys are sleeping after lunch. No problem, either way. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I've collected some data. I've let my PowerShell scripts run. I'm going to go ahead and stop the trace and the event session. So for the event session, the syntax is almost the same as my start, right? Alter event session on server, state equals stop. For my trace, SP trace set status, you pass in the trace ID, and then you set it to 0. Now at this point, the definitions for both of these are still there, meaning I could go ahead and I could start my event session, and I could actually start my trace again. I'd have to remove that file, but I could start it up again using SP trace set status and set it to 1. Most of the time, I'm going to bet that after you stop to trace, you removed the definition entirely. And you would do that using SP trace set status trace ID of 2. The thing about extended events is I can get rid of that event as event session as well using drop event session on server. But I don't have to because, you know, if you left a trace definition there, when the instance restarted, it went away. That doesn't happen with extended events. It's something that I really love about it. Meaning once I create an event session that I like, that works well for me, I can just leave it there. And then I can start and stop it whenever needed. And I can have 10, 15, 20 of these, which I do in a lot of my client environments. But if I want to get rid of it, I can drop event session, and I can use SP trace set status to 2 to get rid of my trace. So at this point, if I came back up here to see what exists, I can see that I'm just back to the default trace and back to system health and always on. That's it. So now let's just take a second and let's look at our output here. So this is the file from trace. Let's just open it that way. Right? This is what we know and love. Remind me, how useful is this for analysis, this window right here? Not very, right? I can. I can scroll. I've spent a lot of time scrolling in this window, I have to say. Um, I, can, I can move the columns around. I can, I can do a find, right? I can look for particular text in here. But I'm really limited in what kind of analysis I do within this UI. I would guess that a lot of you either push this out to a table and then write queries against it, or you use a third-party tool like ClearTrace or ReadTrace or Cure to do your analysis against those, these files. And that's fine. And that's what I used to do as well. But with extended events, it's a little bit different. So here's the output file that is created from extended events. And one thing you may notice immediately is that this file name isn't the file name we gave it. We gave it XE reads filter trace, but then there's all these numbers after it. And those numbers are put there by SQL Server when the event session starts. It's the number of seconds between, I think it's January 1st, 1700, and the time that you start the event session. So that each file name is uniquely named, which is great, because I don't have to worry about coding for that like I used to in Trace. So here's my file, and I can just drag that into Management Studio and open it up. Now, this is, this is really uninteresting, isn't it? You look at this and you think, wow, that's what you're giving me instead of the profiler UI. And when you open up the file for the first time, the only two columns I see are name and timestamp because these are the only two that are common to every event in extended events. And at this point, Management Studio doesn't know all of the events that are in there, so it only shows those two columns by default. But I certainly can customize this. I can take duration, and I can show that, and logical reads, and I can show that. So I can click on any of these columns down here in the Details pane and add them. Or I can come up to the Choose Columns button, and I can say, all right, I also want to look at, maybe I want to look at CPU, and maybe I also want to look at the statement that was executed. OK. So now I can 
make this kind of look like profiler. And I can move the columns around just like I could before. And I can search in here just like I could before, right? If I want to look at the statement, I can find next and it'll find entries that have product or whatever text in them. But I can do more in this UI. I can push it out to a table. I know some of you love to do that. I can write it out to a table or I can save it out to a CSV file. Um, I can use read trace to do analysis on an XEL file just like I can with trace, but I can do a lot of what I need right here in this window. I can sort on my columns, which I could never do before. Um, I can also group on them and I can do aggregations, which I'll come back to later. And I can filter this data. I can filter based on a particular time or I can filter on a particular field. So there's a lot of manipulation that I can do right here in this window where I don't have to push it to a table or I don't have to use another tool. All right, any questions before I flip back to the slides? No questions. <laughs> they're, they're getting into those chocolate brownies or whatever, right? Um, that's okay. I had a cupcake earlier. It's all good. All right. So when we talk about events, we had events in Trace, and we have them in extended events as well. And they correspond to things that happen in the SQL, SQL Server code that we might be familiar with, we might not, especially when you start to look at extended events and you see how many events are there. But these are events right here that you know, you understand what they mean, right? A data file auto grow, a sort warning, like the sort and the hash warnings that come um, in TempDB, um, an object was created, a statement completed, a lock was acquired, a recompile, a deadlock graph. These are things that you know. And this is the information that we capture with trace and we capture with extended events. Now, the events are similar between uh, the tools. So in trace, we would see SP statement completed. In extended events, we see SP underscore statement completed. It's typically pretty easy to find the comparable event in extended events. There's a couple things to be aware of. One is the data file auto grow event. In extended events, there's database file size changed. And funny enough, in extended events, there's also an event that talks about a data file changing size and a log file changing size. Because if you remember, in trace, there's both data file auto grow and log file auto grow. And in extended events, they initially had two separate events. And then at some point, they changed it to just be one. So if you're looking at file growths, this is the event you want to use. The other two are still there, but they won't give you any information. So the event names are pretty close. They're not always exactly the same, but they're pretty close. As of SQL Server 2012, every event from trace has a comparable event in extended events, with the exception of audit events. If you use trace to do any kind of auditing, when you get to 2012 and higher, you want to use server audit. And there aren't events and extended events for auditing. You should be using server audit to do that. I will tell you right now that if you're running 2008 R2 and below, stick with trace. 2012 and higher, then I strongly recommend extended events. And the reasons are the events aren't all there in extended events until 2012, and the UI is there in 2012. So if we look at events by version, you'll see that as of 2012, there's over 600 events including all of those from Trace. In Service Pack 1 of 2016, we're up to 1,300 events. Does anybody know how many events there are in Trace in every single one of these versions? Anybody have a guess? OK, you probably have one in your head if you don't want to say it, and that's fine. It's 180. So. Extended events, I don't know if anybody was close, but extended events, again, it's a new way to look at troubleshooting. It's also the only way to troubleshoot new features because they're not adding any of these events to trace. So if you want to look at anything related to availability groups or in-memory OLTP or column store or buffer pool extensions or query store, you've got to use extended events. 
again, one of the things to note about the events is that they have this default payload, which is a set of elements that are always returned um, and can't be altered. And then there's an asterisk there, and you're probably wondering, well, why does she have that? And that's because there are elements that you can choose to collect or not, even though they're part of the default payload. So that's what the little asterisk is for. But understand that there's nowhere you can go in and reconfigure what elements it collects by default. And I'll show this to you when we get to the UI. Now our predicates, these are our filters. This is what determines whether or not we're going to capture the event information. And they're really cool for a couple of reasons. One is I can use them on either those elements from the default payload or I can use them on these global predicate fields. So let's say that I was looking at statement completed and statement completed doesn't have database ID as part of the default payload, but I want to filter on that. I can because it's a global predicate source that's available to me. So this is nice because I have a lot of flexibility on what I can filter on. The other thing that predicates, that make predicates very powerful is something called the short circuit evaluation which means that as soon as part of the predicate evaluates to false, it immediately drops out and says, I'm done. It's not going to continue going through the predicate. So say, for example, I had um, database ID of 5 and reads greater than or equal to 100,000. Now, hopefully, I don't have a lot of queries that have reads greater than or equal to 100,000. I'll tell you, I saw a 240. 241 million read query this morning. That was a doozy. But let's assume that most of the time I don't have anything over 100,000 reads. So if I write my predicate as database ID equals 5 and reads greater than 100,000, and most of my queries are against database ID 5, then it goes in and it says, okay, database ID 5, yes, and are my reads greater than 100,000? No. Okay, next query, reads, or database ID 5, yes, reads greater than 100,000, no. So it still goes through every single time, right, and verify and looks at first the database ID. And that's not a lot, but it's overhead. And really, reads greater than or equal to 100,000 is way less likely to occur. So when I put that first, query comes in, reads greater than, nope, it's not. Doesn't even look at the database ID. Next query comes in, reads greater than, nope, done. Right? So the short circuit evaluation means that as soon as it evaluates to false, it kicks out, which is really good and is, a, again, a performance um, benefit that exists within <laughs> extended events. Now, one of the things to note about predicates, I talked about those actions, which are these additional fields that you can add. And actions and global predicate sources can have the same name, but they are not the same thing. And when I get into the UI, I'm going to show that to you again. It can be a little bit confusing, but understand that they are two different entities within extended events. Also understand that if I filter on something that's part of the default payload, that's less overhead than if I filter on a global predicate source. Because for something like SP statement completed, duration comes along with that default payload. So filtering on that is really easy. But if I want to filter on database ID, that's not part of the default payload, which means that SQL Server, when the event fires, it has to go get the database ID as well to see if that predicate evaluates to true or not. So think about, when you're creating these event sessions, what actions are really necessary and what's the best thing for me to filter on, both in terms of um, uniqueness and making sure I get the right events and in terms of performance. So the actions, which we mentioned earlier, is additional operation that Extended Events is going to perform. It's going to go collect the database ID. It's going to collect the session ID. It might go create a mini dump for the thread, or it might create a full stack dump. Um, you, can, you can do some dangerous things, actually, with these actions. The good thing is that the action fires only if the predicate evaluates to true. Right? That has to happen first before any actions are collected. But these actions can be very powerful. So think about what's really needed. Understand that some of them have big <laughs> side effects. Um, and some of them can have a lot of overhead based on a particular event and based on how frequently that event fires. Now my targets. Is, are the destination for that data. So we talked about the event file target. 
I have four other ones, the ring buffer, the event counter, the histogram, and event pairing. And the event file basically gives me my data in raw format, format, which I can then analyze. And that's what we're used to, and that's what you'll probably use initially the most because that's what you're comfortable with. That's great. Over time, you're going to start thinking about maybe aggregating your data and letting SQL Server, letting extended events do it for you. And that's where the events like the event count, or excuse me, the targets like the event counter and the histogram and event pairing come in very handy. So here's the order of events in extended events. It encounters the event like a deadlock. And it says, OK, are we capturing this event? And if we are, if that's true, then I want you to continue in collection mode. So go collect the payload data. So for a deadlock, it's going to pull the, the deadlock graph information, right? And then it's going to perform predicate evaluation. Maybe I am filtering on a database ID. Right, maybe I only want to see deadlocks for a specific database. I really probably care about them for all of them, but maybe I'm, I'm currently concerned with one database. So if the predicate evaluates to true, then that means that our event's going to fire and we're going to publish it. So then if I have any actions on there, those need to run at that point. And then push that data out to my synchronous targets. One thing I didn't mention yet was that there's synchronous and asynchronous targets. And a synchronous target means that the data has to go um, immediately out to it versus an asynchronous target where the data first goes to this intermediate set of memory buffers and then goes out to the target. Now, the asynchronous option here where it goes to the memory buffers and then the target is what used to happen with trace, what still happens with trace. There were intermediate buffers in trace where the data was served, and it's the same for extended events. And then it goes out to the target, the final location. So why does this matter? Because I want you to understand where predicate evaluation occurs, and that it happens pretty early on, and only if it evaluates to true will these actions fire. Now, let's look and see what this looks like in the UI, because as much as you may or may not love T-SQL, I think it's a lot easier to pick up extended events when you start here. So here's my session, and I have, let's see, actually we're going to change this. I like changing things on the fly. It makes it much more interesting. Let's go ahead and create an event session. And we have new session wizard and we have new session. New session wizard doesn't give me all of the same options as new session. So I'd rather create a new session because I want all of my options. And so we're going to create one here called track queries. And notice that I have templates, just as I did in trace. I have some default templates that are included here in extended events, and I can create my own. I can create my own categories, and I can create my own templates. If you're interested, the activity tracking template is analogous to the default trace. It just doesn't include those audit events because, again, those have been shifted to the audit feature. I'm not going to use a template today. I have some options with regard to the schedule here. I can have this event session start when the instance starts, which means that it persists. Like I said before, these can persist between restarts. And that means that I don't have to write a stored procedure or any other fancy code to make my event session start up automatically. If I have that checkbox checked, it will do that for me. I can also have it start right after I create it, and I can watch the live data. I'm not going to do either one of those today. And then I have this really cool option called causality tracking. And it's spelled wrong here. If anybody's astute enough to, to read all that, it's fixed in 2014. Don't worry. But this lets me see how my events are related. So sometimes in trace, you might have gotten really creative when you were setting up your, your trace definition and added things like transaction ID and who knows what else to try and, and your session ID to look to see what events happened in what order for a particular session. You don't have to get all crazy anymore. Causality tracking will do that for you. So for events that are related, it assigns a GUID to those events. 
And then it also has an ID so that you know which ones are related and what order they happened in. It's pretty cool. Then I've got my events. So these are the events available, just like if we were here in Trace and we went into events and we said show all events. Actually, wait, hang on, let's do it this way because I want to make a point. Here's this. I go into my events, right? Now, how much time have you spent in this window doing this? Where is that event? Unless, it, unless I'm the only one that's like a really slow learner and cannot remember for the life of me where some of these events are, right? But I know you've spent time scrolling and clicking. I can't be the only one. Here's one of the things I love about extended events. I come in here to event library and I type completed and I see all of the events that have the text of completed. This is great. I know there's events that have DBCC in them. And so I see this event, but I know there's more. And so one of the things to pay attention to, first of all, is that by default, you're only searching in the event names. Well, the events also have descriptions and they've got fields. So if I look in event names and descriptions, it should be searching down here in this description field. But I'm still not seeing my event because I know there's more. So look underneath this channel option. And you'll see that by default, only the admin, the analytic, and operational events are selected. These are the ones that you'll most commonly use. But sometimes, if you really want to get into the internals and see how something works, you might do the debug events. And notice that when I do that, now I see that I have some additional events that have DBCC in them. So this search functionality is pretty cool because I can look at event names, the descriptions, the fields, and then I want to make sure that I'm possibly seeing all of the events. There's no way to make debug be selected by default, just so you know. So let's say that I want to add, let's go back to my completed events. So statement completed here. And let's just say SQL batch completed for fun. And when I select an event, do you see down here on the right, I have, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, how sad. That whole thing went away. Really? It did. Hold on one second. Sorry, I hit escape. And there's my loud keyboard that nobody but me loves. OK, so completed, SQL statement completed, SQL batch completed. When I highlight this down here, I have the default payload. These are the events that are included by default with that event. So I can see that right here in the UI. Now from here, I want to configure the events. I want to set my predicates. I want to configure any actions. To do that, I need to hit this configure button, which is way over here on the right. And it's not all on one window. Some people really don't love that. And the reason it's not all on one window is because all of the events and the combination of things that you can configure don't fit well on one window. So I like to make little sound effects. I click configure and I go whoop and it slides over. And if I wanted to go back and select events, I can select, select, whoop, and I go back. So we'll come over here. And I've got SQL batch, SQL batch completed and SQL statement completed. And now for each of these, I can go in and configure my actions. I can configure my predicate. I can look at my default payload. Remember I said that for events, this default payload cannot be configured. And then I had a little asterisk. And that's because of something like this. Batch text is part of the default payload. And you can see that that little box is checked. But if I really didn't want batch text for some reason, I could uncheck it. So that's the customization that's allowed. For SQL statement completed, I've got parameterized plan handle and I've got statement. I can collect these or not. If there's something else that I want that's not part of the default payload, like database ID, I can go into my actions or my global fields and I can find database ID and I can check it. I can highlight both events and check something, for example, session ID, right? So you can see that if I look at the little lightning bolt, this tells me what actions I have. If I want to look at my filter, I can come back here. I can highlight both of these. I can select logical reads here, right? Greater than, equal to, 
10,000. And I can again get creative, right? Logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000 and let's see, database ID equals five. And I could do an or, right? Logical reads greater than or equal to 10,000 or SQL Server database ID. I can get very creative, very complex in writing these predicates. For the moment, we're just gonna worry about logical reads. Then I'm gonna configure my target, which is the data storage page here. So I've got the targets that I listed. We're gonna use the event file. We're gonna write out to the event file. By default, in SQL Server 2012, it would include the full path here to the, to the error log location. In SQL Server 2014, it just lists the name of the file. It's going to the same location, the error log location. If you want it to go somewhere else, just specify that here, right? If I want this to go to ctemp, it will. I don't need to specify .xel. Remember, it's gonna append those numbers to the end of it. I usually set my max file size at about 512 megs because it's much larger than that and pulling that into Management Studio 